Group, I, I'd like to say my name is Flynn Hampton and I'd like to welcome you all to our, our forum, Building Power from the Bottom Up. Um, welcome everyone. Um, just to give a little bit of history, uh, the Chicago Teachers Solidarity Campaign originally came out of the Occupy Labor Working Group. Um, since its inception, it hasn't had really any sort of staff or funds, so it's kind of amazing uh, what we've been able to accomplish just with um, the wonderful community activists that we've had involved. Um, we started out having a press conference um, at the budget hearings. We managed to hit all the different budget hearings. And then we moved on to do an action at the Hyde Park Hyatt. Uh, they're building a Hyatt Hotel um, in Hyde Park using TIF funds, uh, property tax funds. So um, we kind of wanted to start there by showing people where their tax money was going when CPS was saying uh, they had no money to put towards public schools. Um, after that, we went ahead and had an educational town hall that was oriented towards um, really giving the community, parents, and other individuals um, information about what's really going on with their teachers, with their you know children in the classroom, you know what the classrooms are lacking. We had teachers speak, we had community members speak. It was really amazing. Um, and then, of course, uh, during the strike itself. Uh, we were involved on the picket lines um, in the streets during the downtown rallies. We were all there and helped coordinate um, the volunteers for the strike center. Um, and then also when the injunction was announced, we, uh, we held a press conference the following morning uh, speaking out against uh, the injunction against the CTU, which was um, rather ridiculous. <laughs> um, but just to kind of back up a little bit, for those of you who don't know, um, the Chicago Teachers Solidarity Campaign is made up of a variety of amazing individuals. Um, we have multiple, multiple unions, um, community groups, and then just um, parents and individuals who aren't part of groups but felt like they wanted to get involved somehow uh, and found us. So, so that's who we are. Uh, and now, after the CTU strike, uh, we're hoping that this forum will give us some concrete lessons so that we can move forward uh, and build a rank and file movement of workers that, to fight against the oppression um, and for rights and conditions that the workers really deserve. So uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Jesse Sharkey will be our first speaker. He is the vice president of CTU. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to begin by recognizing um, the tremendous work building uh, this movement um, that, um, that was done by the people in this room. Um, everyone here has been part of really a tremendous um, organizational effort that moved the city and uh, stopped a number of the worst aspects of school reform, um, put the voice of teachers, parents, and community members back on the map in terms of fighting for high quality schools, um, got the attention of the city, the state, the country. And for that, everyone here deserves to give themselves a round of applause. I, um, I see many friends uh, here. I also assume uh, that there are some enemies. Uh, the last time <laughs> I gave a, a talk in this very room, uh, EAG was recording it. I, I looked terrible on the tape. <laughs> You know, the Kyle Olson, the, the, the right-wing uh, blogger out of Michigan, uh, did a hit job. L uh, luckily, it wasn't too bad. Um, uh, but that, um, but that there's no doubt that what we're doing has the attention of powerful enemies. And um, I, I, I want to take a minute to say that the, the part, parent, bringing parents, community, students, activists, all stripes together with union labor uh, is something which we can't take for granted in this current climate. Um, in, in our country. That is to say that we're going to defend public education on the, on the basis of solidarity. Uh, to say that the, the public schools are a service which benefits all people on our side. And that unions will fight for schools on that basis. Not on the basis that, you know, I, I, I want a good job with a good pension and that basis alone. Uh, on, on, on something that's much broader. I, you know, look, we stopped merit pay. We forced the board to hire 600 additional um, world language, uh, phys ed, art teachers, music teachers, other specials. Um, you know, there's a lot of other things that this contract fight won. But we understand there's a tremendous number of things that we never addressed. That, that it, it, if, if what we thought was going to happen at the end of the strike was that we were going to achieve 
you know, high quality public education, uh, you know, that is somehow commensurate with the kind of schools that, that you know, the billionaires kids get when, when they go to Parker or some other, uh, uh, you know, private school, independent school, I guess they call them, um, that we are deluding ourselves. That's, that's not the way this struggle is going to go. And um, so for us, you know, we set our sights high and we understand that we're part of a long struggle. And that it's a, and, and that it, and it's a, this is a, an effort to continue, continue building. And what the outpouring of sentiment, what you know, we picketed with twenty thousand people a day. We marched with twenty five thousand people a day. The, the, there were there was massive support in every picket line in every neighborhood of the city. And what that does is it didn't. It really wasn't just about winning a, a contract. Uh, obviously, that was important. It's, it's, you know, that's that's why you strike, right? It, it, but it, but it's all, it was also about building the forces on our side to make us more able to fight for the things that we know our schools deserve next time. So thank everyone for being here. Um, I really want to just make two points um, tonight. I'll try to. I'll, I'll, I will say that there's a lot of things to be said in terms of analyzing, you know, the the, the building work in the CTU over the last several years, um, which really started when we were, you know, co collections of rank and file activists in our in our buildings, fighting school closing fights and whatnot. Um, there's way more to be said about all that than can be said. I'm, I'm not going to try to cover every question. Uh, I really want to make sort of one point along that line, which is that in a, in a, in a basement of, of a union hall on a Saturday night, um, th that what we do matters. And that, and I want to talk a little bit more about the role of, of, of activists. And then the second thing that I, I, I just want to say is that there's going to be a fight coming in Chicago sooner rather than later about the very, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna continue to sharpen and, and become more critical about the future of public schools. And I'm confident this is a winnable fight for our side. The change is coming. That the, 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 the entire era in which, what, in, in, in which sort of Hollywood can do, you know, waiting for Superman, and our side has nothing to do but, but cower from that. That where they, where they can put a movie Won't Back Down, and their plan for Won't Back Down was to release to mass audiences 2,500 theaters around the city, and then use it as a set piece for launching uh, um, uh, parent trigger laws around the country. That, like, that, that kind of thing where, where their side can act without any response from our side, that is going to be over. There's change coming. In this, era, in, in, in this area of, uh, of our public life, and that we have an important role to play in it. And that, that'll be my second point. So, I, I, what we do matters. I, the, I'm heartened to see 100 or so people out on a Saturday night to talk about the Chicago Teachers Union strike, the struggle for high quality public schools. I, it's worth us thinking for a minute what it, what it was exactly that happened when the CTU struck. Because I said before, 20,000 people picketed. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, we, I think we, had, um, we have numbers in. Uh, in the entire city, 26,000 members, exactly 20 people in the entire city uh, crossed the picket line and went to work. Yeah. It's a pretty good number. <laughs> but the, it, it, and, uh, and believe me, those two numbers have everything to do with each other. Right? And the, the public sentiment, the press, the rest of it has everything to do with the 20,000. Because I, it's not that there weren't negative press stories. There were. I, you know, the Tribune continued to run poison. It's a, it was overwhelmed by the fact that everywhere you looked, there was a sea of supporters. You, you know, you couldn't go by any school in the city without people going by, signs, honking, high fives, bringing out tamales, and, you, you know, the rest of it. Behind the 20,000, though, is a couple of critical pieces. And it's like we had a, the CTU had about, went into the strike without 1,000 activists. Th that is to say, often delegates, but not always, who were, in a, in a way, the real heroes of the strike, who made the phone calls, who knew who was coming to the picket line every day, who made sure there were signs, who figured out where people would go to the bathroom. It, but, but more importantly than that, in some ways, who, who won the argument in their schools about why we were doing what we were doing, who communicated with parents, who made sure that the arguments about we need art teachers, we need math teachers, we need libraries, who made sure that those arguments were dominant arguments of the strike. You, 
Without that thousand people, the whole thing is crap. I, it doesn't mean anything. It, it, it's me and Karen on TV. Probably wouldn't even be any TV camera. You, you know, it, you, you couldn't do it. The existence of those thousand was very conscious. It was, it was absolutely 100% thought through, talked about, debated, planned for years. And I, 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 can, I, I don't have the time to go through every example, but I, I want to just put it out there because, because that's the requirement for, for successful struggle that, that's mass and basis. It's not figuring out what the right militant kind of line is. Militant struggle without mass struggle doesn't, you know, okay, great, you and your buddy want to go get guns. Bad idea, right? Militant struggle and mass struggle that, that have a relationship with each other, that actually can move the whole city, right? And so, a thousand. You know, it's not that easy to get. It, I mean, going, heading towards a strike helps, frankly, everyone gets that. You, you get a lot of buy-in from delegates. They, they spend a lot of time thinking, oh, this could be my job. I guess I better pay it, right? But the, but the, the way that was developed, go, going back in time, had to do with, with the union leadership self-consciously saying, we're going to start with what we have. In 04, when the first groups of us started coming together as union oppositionists, as people who are opposed to the school closings, the number of people who were part of a, of a, of a let's build a program on that basis was small. We would give talks in union hall basements to three or four people. Right, Noreen? <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, it's partly, it, it, it's to say that this is something which people have worked on for a long time, which we're serious about, a set of ideas, and built. Um, the, the thing that I want to say next, though, is that there was, there was a, a successful strike in the sense that it produced a contract, it, high level of public support, many activists participated, uh, there's a, a sense of morale, there's initiative at every level of the CTU, P people, are, there, there's a tremendous membership involvement. The, there's a, a strong set of connections that have been built between, between the community and their teachers and the parents. Um, in, in some ways, we're in a better position to fight to defend public schools than we were. All those things are true. And yet, we can, all, we can predict with 100% assurity that the, the next set of attacks on public schools are going to be sharper, are going to be worse. Um, I'll, I'll just give a few examples that... that Really, at the heart of that is the question of the board with the program to replace 100 or 150 public schools with privately run non-union charter schools. The closing and reopening uh, charters, which are, of course, politically connected and the rest of it. But that, that if that happens, it represents a corresponding, a weakening of the, of, of the unionized base of the city and a strengthening of the whole, whole set of political forces that support the mayor. That, that, that will, there's going to be other fights, don't get me wrong, there's going to be a fight over testing, there's going to be a fight over funding, there's going to be a fight over pensions, we could keep going. But we can fight funding and still and maintain our base. If they close 150 public schools and Walner and Hell, who's the mayor's campaign manager, gets to open 150 new charter schools, we're that much weaker for every, every other fight that we participate in. The, and yet I'm still confident this is a fight that we can take on. And I'm just going to say a few things about what I think that fight looks like, and then I'm going to stop. The fight over closing schools is, at its heart, a fight about racism, and the racism of the program of Emanuel and the other rulers of the city. <laughs> if you look at a map of where they're going to do it, it, it's, it it's, it's completely concentrated on the west sides and the south sides. There isn't a single school that's highly under-enrolled north of North Avenue, zero. Not a single one up there. They're all west. They're all south. And, and the problem is they say, well, we need to close schools to save money. And what it means is that they're going to close schools 
on the south and west sides in order to extract resources out of the poorest neighborhoods in the city, in order to be able to save money on educating kids on the west side. And those schools already don't have libraries. And those schools already don't have nurses. And those schools already don't have playgrounds. And I could go on. Rather than saying, we're going to take the resources that are there and redistribute them in a better way, they're simply going to save money so they don't have to pay taxes and extract that money elsewhere. Deeply racist program. Our goal, uh, what, what ha the thing that we have to figure out how to do as a city, is to, is to move from what's always been, there's, there's been a series of fights about school closings since 04 when they started the Rent 2010 program. Before that even. 03, they did it in um, Kenwood, Oakland. Those have been episodic. They, they're doing short spikes of fights. But then the school closes and you go down and you, get the, and you get the next fight the next year. We need to figure out how to build that army of a thousand. Has to be recreated on this issue. The people in this room have a role to play in that. The self-conscious leadership, training on the issue, people need to take their own political education seriously. We take work in the community seriously. We take work around school closing seriously. Starting now. Not wait till the school list comes out. If we can build a layer of people who, who know something, who know how to organize, who see themselves as leaders, then we have to figure out how to have a mass struggle around school closings. I'm taught in 63, 200,000 African American students boycotted the Chicago public schools around fire code violations. Fire was a big deal, right? Closing 150 public schools is a big deal too. Can we get a mass movement? I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's possible. But, I, but you, you begin to feel that things are moving in the city. You begin to say that there's things that are possible that, weren't, that were impossible a couple of years ago. I, you know, I don't know if it's the Arab Spring that makes me think it, or Wisconsin that makes me think it, or Occupy that makes me think it, or the CTU strike in the way that was supported. They all make me think it. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that everyone in this room has got a role to play in, in, in fighting to make sure that, that, there is, that, that what we do next transforms the kind of, the, the, the kind of fight, uh, the kind of fight our side is capable of. It's like nothing that they expect. We, we, we can move the city on this stuff. We, 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 we can actually make a real movement happen. It's, it's going to take some work. We don't know in advance how, what it's going to look. I, it's not predictable, but it's worth a try. Thanks. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to do a shout out to all of you because I know that you really helped make the strike effective in, le in leaving Rom bruised, battered, <laughs> crying, having nightmares about Red. <laughs> okay? And we really had big wins for the kids overall. Well, I just more want to talk about what went into the strike, how do we organize as rank and files to really make the strike effective? Because it didn't come out of nowhere. It took a long time and a lot of work, which I know most of you guys realize. So organizing for my school really started um, about two summers ago. So I went to a full five-day contract training with this crazy instructor named Steve Ashby. <laughs> <laughs> and he taught me how to make contract action teams, which is, I think, really one of the most effective ways with organizing the schools. So with the contract action teams, I chose one member from each grade level. And we made it diverse in terms of age, um, in terms of race, and also subject area. And these eventually turned into the strike lieutenants during strike time. So with our members being spread throughout the building, we were able to disseminate information about upcoming union events and other union news. So our teachers were really informed. And part of that, getting more informed because of all the news that with bad misinformation was really, really important. And these teams also plan actions to grow our unity and power. So we started small, just getting everyone to wear red was a start. And then from there, we grew. So we had informational pickets, we made flyers, speaking out to the parents, speaking out to the community to tell them why we needed this strike authorization vote. Um, we also involved the local school council. We wrote them a letter 
saying support us with our contract demands. These are things that will help your children in school. And all these actions helped us become more organized and prepared for the strike. Now don't get me wrong, okay, it wasn't a cakewalk. It took a lot of work. Um, really for the past three years that I'm working, every morning, every lunch, all the preps, was basically speaking one-on-one -on -one to teachers, okay? So it took a lot of work, because a lot of our teachers were even anti-union. But I would say by June of last year, almost all the teachers were on board. There were teachers that were anti-union before, hated the union, and now we're preaching to other teachers to, you better vote yes for that strike authorization vote, okay? Um, but also, we had, we had some other issues, okay? We also had a power-hungry LSC who would actually even sometimes sabotage our actions. So in June, we set up a community forum. We flyered all the parents for the whole week, and everyone seemed really excited to go. When the community forum, when, it's ha when it happened, there were only about 20 parents there. We're like, okay, well, what happened? Where is everybody? We find out later on, the parents from our local school council, our LSC, actually went out to the parents and told them not to come. Told them it was a waste of time, okay? So we definitely had obstacles and things we had to work on. So after that, we had one-on-one, -on -one just discussions with parents after school. Um, we passed out informational flyers, and we also elected some new members to the LSC that were more supportive of the teachers. But I would say overall with our school, the biggest problem, which I'm sure a lot of unions can agree, it was apathy. Um, my school is a magnet, so I'll say the academy. And a lot of teachers thought, you know, this doesn't really affect us. A lot of these issues, you know, they never really thought about it. They didn't come to rallies. Um, they didn't really even know much. If you would have asked them a few years ago about charters, they wouldn't even know. they would be like, oh, I don't know, they're okay. Um, so really, that was made a big difference, just getting out, talking to people. And with the strike authorization vote, before the strike authorization vote, we took a mock vote. So with that mock vote, we set up the ballots, just like it would look with the real vote, and we had everyone vote, and only one voted no. And even with that one person that voted no, our teachers were furious. They're like, who voted no? Can we find them? Okay? Put dead rats in their mailbox, okay? But you better believe that person did not vote no when it came to the real strike authorization. So when that strike authorization vote came, we took the full three days for that vote. It wasn't a one-day vote. Because we had six teachers who were out with babies or deaths or illnesses. And we drove around to their houses. We drove out to the suburbs all around the city to get that vote. So we had 100% voted yes for the strike authorization. <laughs> and in the whole city, it was overwhelming vote yes. And overwhelming in terms of turnout also. Um, but when the strike actually happened on the first day, we had 100% attendance. I'm a large school, 80 staff, 100% attendance. And with those seven days, there's only about two teachers that were out, maybe once or twice with emergencies. We stayed strong for the full seven days. I do have to admit, some of it might be because we got pancakes made for us by parents. They're out there cooking enchiladas for lunch um, and hot coffee every single day. We had breakfast and lunch provided for us. And we also had our band came out and played music for us every day. We had a whole ensemble of a band. So that was very, very nice. Um, we even, our school was a contingency school. So as some parents would be coming to drop off their kid, we would say, you know, there's no teachers in there. You know there's not actual instruction taking place. Some of the parents would just drop their kids off with us, and they would join us in the strike, and even some of the parents joined us in the strike. So that, that was definitely really amazing. But I would say what really helped us with attendance, phone trees and email trees. Every single day, we had someone call every single member. So everyone called about four or five people and talked with them. Not texted, they didn't just email, they talked so they could actually hear their voice, if you could hear wavering. So I did some trainings on that. If you talk to them and you say, oh, they sound a little hesitant, okay, ask them questions. Ask them if they have concerns. And it really kept people, you know, accountable. They really wanted to show up then. So that was a, that was a big deal with turnout. 
um, and how it kind of looked just to go into while we were on strike. Every morning we had a discussion. Okay, how's this day going to look? We set up the stations. Um, and we also discussed around the contract. So what are things that you can live with and you'd go back for or what do you want us to stay out for? And at the end of the day, we had a big discussion and a reflection about how that day went. What can we improve for tomorrow? Um, you know, and just discuss different issues. But overall, I would say that my picket line was a lot of fun. I would have to say it was the best picket line. I don't know, maybe slightly biased. Um, but overall, morale was high. People brought their babies, their puppies. We blocked trucks from dropping off supplies. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. We even stood up to our assistant principal. Our principal actually was on sick leave exactly the amount of time that we were on strike. <laughs> so that was interesting. Um, with our assistant principal, we had some issues with him the first day while we were blocking the truck. He actually told our teachers, told a couple of them, that they should sit um, like his dog and be well-mannered. He had brought his dog. The teachers were pretty mad. So at our end of the day discussion, while well, he was standing out there, I told my teachers, I said, you do not have a boss right now. You are not working. I don't care who was your boss last week. You do not have a boss right now. So we were not intimidated. I would have to say none of us were really intimidated by, you know, they had the network chiefs out there who are, they're like the bosses of our, our boss, um, and the assistant principal out there. But I don't think anyone was intimidated. We all felt the unity and the power. But I would say we need to keep this momentum going. I think sometimes it's easy to fall back into old habits. Um, so I hope, you know, as we have this discussion and have questions going, we'll talk more about how we can keep this fight going for the school closures coming up. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. All right, so next we have Steve Ashby, a CTSC organizer and University of Illinois Labor Studies professor. So I think this is just the, uh, just the beginning of telling the story. We're going to need to tell this story over and over again. We need every union in the country to know this story. We need the CTU to be teachers. The first thing I just want to say about that is, is this was not for the unions in this city, for the unions in this country. This, the CTU situation was not different from your situation. Um, this was not a militant local, as Jesse said, two years ago. It was a fairly top-down union. Not much membership participation. The caucus of rank and file educators organized because there wasn't independently of the union to fight school closings and they took on the Democratic Party. I think in some ways it's easier to fight the Republican Party because you've got a natural base of people that hate their guts. <laughs> but it was harder to fight the Democratic Party. Yeah, Democrats are trying. <laughs> they are trying. So one lesson is if the CTU did it, you can do it. There's nothing special about them. Well, <laughs> and there's no secret wand, there's no secret plan. Can't tell you what they did in 30 seconds and you just go do it. It's about organization, it's about structure, it's about hard work, it's about putting in the resources and putting in the time. But it's all doable. I want to talk kind of big picture of what Sarah's here. Sorry, I got a little cold here about the contract campaign, which is basically, it's, it's so simple, really, in concept. And every union should be doing it. And it's always amazed me that they don't. And hopefully that'll change with this victory. You educate, you organize, and you mobilize your members to put pressure on your employer to negotiate a fair contract. You build power at work. You transform your union. You build a union from the bottom up, a member-driven union. And in that process, you unleash the power of your members to reach out to the community and strengthen your support with the public and community groups. You never win a strike these days by leading a well-run strike. You win a strike by building the foundation over months and years leading up to that strike. You win a strike by the lengthy, hard process of organizing the members, by creating an organizing structure to win, planning a strategy to win, as the CTU did. 
One of our slogans in labor is uh, one day longer. You see it on signs, which you've got to last one day longer if you're on strike. But it's such a suicidal slogan when it's your entire strategy. <laughs> well, we'll go on strike, we'll last one day longer. That's why we've been losing all these years. Another strategy common in labor is what I call the lawn chair picket line strategy. You go on strike, you say you're going to last one day longer, you tell your members to go sit in lawn chairs, take turns, and that's it. That's their entire role. And then they hire scabs and then the union is broken. I, I talked to one retired CTU or, uh, from the 80s strikes at one of our meetings and she said, well, in the 80s we went on strike, we picketed for two hours in the morning and then they went out to breakfast and we sent our people home. And I said, but we're planning daily mass rallies. And she said, oh, that, no, we can't ask that much of our members. We picket a couple hours in the morning, we go to breakfast and we go home. Well, I, I guess they won their strikes in the 80s, but that is a suicidal strategy for, for this decade. When we think about the highlights of this struggle, and there's so many, the Labor Day rally. We're, we're marching, we're supposed to be surrounding City Hall, but there are too many of us, and we're in the streets, and then, then we're going down to CPS. It's such a joyful feeling when you take the street, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 30,000 on Monday in the streets. The, the joy, as, as Sarah's talking about, the, just the joy in people's faces. The, the, not like they're happy to be on strike, but the power that you feel. Um, the smiles, the singing. Every day it felt to me like it was, I was hearing something new. The, the, we're not gonna take it, I'm not a great singer. But I just loved it when people started singing that. Let's sing it together, okay? <laughs> Again, my speech is gonna go on a little long. We gotta break up the speeches, all right? We're not gonna take it. No, we're not gonna take it. We're not gonna take it anymore. All right. Which, you know, I mean, there's union consciousness and there's raising consciousness, as Sarah said, and transforming people step by step into identifying with their union. But then there's that next step of, you know what, it's not just my union. This is a union town. We are union people. This is a broad union struggle. And that's what that, that chanting meant to me. Just as kind of a side note, we need, to, we need to educate, but we also need to share our exhilaration, I think. We need to, we need to um, analyze, we have to feel. I, I am so, I just, I feel like I love all these people so much. I just want to hug them all the time. <laughs> all the people in the Solidarity Campaign that I didn't know before, dozens and dozens of people. You know, it's true I'm from California, so maybe I'm a little touchy-feely. It's been a long time. I just, it's a feeling of love, you know? When you're with 30,000 people marching, when you're organizing, when you're, you're in the organizing meetings, you just, it's, it is a feeling of love. And we need to remember that and celebrate that. So, a few things I want to mention that are part of a contract campaign. One is, is just leadership. You need a leadership that wants it to happen. Unfortunately, in too many of our unions, they're scared of the members organizing. They're scared someone's gonna get educated and run against them for office. It, it's suicidal, I'm gonna use this word over and over, it's suicidal. You can't do a campaign like this unless you trust your members, you trust your staff, you trust your organizers, and you're constantly training new member organizers. And this was central to Karen. Karen has a lot of great quotes on this. Here's one I've heard, I trust our membership, totally. When you trust your members, good things happen. The key is people need to decide what they want their union to be. I'm talking about the members. Every union needs to do some soul searching about what the purpose is of the unions. The union doesn't tell, the leaders don't tell the members what to do. Having those discussions in the rank and file is so important. We take democracy seriously. But it wasn't just Karen. It was Jesse. It was Michael. It was Christine. It was all the officers. It was Noreen as the organizing director. It was every organizer had that mentality. It was pervasive. And, and you know, one of our flaws in labor is we seem to have terrible sound systems. So I don't know if you <laughs> heard Karen speak on Labor Day, but uh, it was at Michael Shields from the Fraternal Order of Police, so I've never heard give a speech before. The first time I'd ever, ever, ever seen a FOP representative give a militant speech was in Madison. And I wondered if it would happen, and then he comes up on Labor Day and he's, CTU, this is what we got to do, mobilize the members. So, fight, you know. 
And then he says to Karen, and Karen did it, and Karen, Karen stands up and says no. One small correction, the members did it, not me. That's, that's the kind of leadership you need. Is Michelle Gunderson here? Yeah. So Michelle just uh, Facebooked this morning, we were, and she said, you don't understand the Teachers Union in Chicago unless you understand democracy. To understand the teachers, you have to understand our democracy. It's so true. The second point is long-range planning, which Jesse already kind of talked about. They cut their salaries when they came in. They hired all these organizers. They brought in people for the summer teachers to see you know, who would be the best organizers, who wants to come on staff and quit being a teacher temporarily to do that. They held three uh, conferences of delegates to kind of step by step uh, plan out this contract campaign. The third thing is just creating the structure that Sarah talked about. I mean, a contract campaign committee isn't that complicated. It's broadening the leadership. It's having a committee in every single school, as Sarah talked about, where before there was a one delegate most of them didn't do that much. Staff driven, all the, the only ones that filed grievances for the most part were the staff, the field staff, totally top down, and it's a total bottom up. You gotta build a committee, find the people, draw them into activism. You gotta have the members thinking, I am a leader. And I don't know if it's a thousand, I would say it's two, three, four thousand. I mean, the number of people that identified as leaders that became part of those contract campaigns was huge, and it was a lot of work, step by step, um, the staff and the officers just can't do it all. You can't top down it. You got to train the people, and that's what they did. We have a, a video the Teamsters put out a number of years ago called Power at Work that went first to the district supervisors for their training, and then it was shown at the second delegates conference. If anybody has a union, you want to talk about how to organize a contract campaign, it's on YouTube. We can send you that video. And also, you know, Troublemaker's Handbook, the first and second edition. Great chapters on contract campaigns, if you want that material. So it began, as Sarah said, organizing, the red shirt days, other ideas of actions. Role playing at the second conference. How do you talk with someone? Someone says, I'm scared, my principal's an asshole, I don't want to do it. You know, I got enough problems. Someone says, well, I, what's the point? How can we achieve anything? I'm, I'm glad you're doing it, but I can't. Uh, how do you talk with those people? It takes work. It takes Practice, it takes role playing, school by school and in these conferences. The other point I wanted to mention, and I think this is just really, really important in the contract campaign, is you organize the structure, you draw in the members, you develop the leadership, and then you assess. And they did this over and over again. I think this is really one of the key things. For example, the uh, May 23rd rally, the biggest hall they could get was Roosevelt Auditorium. So that filled with 4,000. There were two or 3,000 more outside at Congress in Michigan, where, you know, the Occupy movement had also marched twice and had 300 arrests. So it had a certain significance to have people there. But what the union said to the committees was, we'll pay for the buses. You do the work. Every school has a bus that you use for field, field trips. We can't do it for you. You, you. This isn't like, you know, some unions like, oh, what, we'll do what the CTU did. We'll just send emails out. Emails is nothing. It's all one-on-one. -on -one. They said to the, every, every building, you fill that bus. Don't, we're not paying for an empty bus. You, you get the people, one-on-one, -on -one, you fill the bus, and you bring them downtown. So every action, like May 23rd, it has four purposes. It shows the union's power to the city, to the mayor, to the city council, to the board. It, sh it has the members feeling their own power. You can feel that on May 23rd. How many teachers do we have here that were there on May 23rd? It's just, you know, this is rocking. I, I got there early and I was in the front and people start coming in and, and you could just feel it like, how many people are gonna, be, you you, are we gonna fill the first floor here? Is it gonna be half empty? I don't know. Right? And then it fills. People are chanting, kind of a roar, and they're singing along to the songs. And then the second tier fills up. And then the third tier fills up. And you can just feel the energy and the sense of the power of the members. And it was, it was so powerful and so beautiful. The second is filling their own power. The third is the message to the public over and over again. This is a fight for the better schools. This is not just a fight for our 
fairness and respect and dignity is that too, but it's a, it's a fight with parents and teachers. Uh, Christine, the financial secretary, gave the indictment, a beautiful speech. The indictment of the schools, and Karen came last. Rank and file people spoke. The 30 bargaining members who were at rank and file teachers behind the, on the stage. And no one uses the word strike from the podium. Very well thought out. And it comes up as a chant from the crowd. The rank and file teachers, the 4,000. Well, maybe there's some secret knowledge there I don't know about. <laughs> But no one from the podium used the word strike, and it was so much more powerful of a message that it came up. You, could, you didn't order 4,000 people to, to chant strike. They did that themselves. And the fourth point, again, is the assessment. Well, where were we weak? What schools didn't send people? What schools were there difficulties? Every step of the way, it was build the members' power, show our, show our unity, have the right message, but also assess. The practice vote on May 10th, a couple weeks before that, because of the 75% law of Senate Bill 7, with the four questions. And the questions are designed so the media will cover it, kind of what is our message. And it's about uh, showing the members feeling their own power and the unity. And they got 20,000? 20, 20, How many people voted in that? But it's an assessment. Where are we weak? Where do we need to? Every, every time something like this happened, like the practice vote, it's, it's the, there's a war room in the CTU, and the charts are all over the wall with every school, and they're marking down how many voted, how many voted, <coughs> how many didn't vote, where do we need to send organizers? So that's, a, that's such a key part of a, of a contract campaign, and with the real strike vote, which of course the mayor thought would be one day. And there was nothing in the law that said that, so it was three days. And he was, of course, furious about, well, we've got to wait for the fact finder report. Of course, then when it came out, he said, oh, it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> they, they voted for three days. And that was so important. And again, it, it's the members feeling their power and expressing that unity to the city and the mayor, but also assessing. So after the first day, the war room again. We, we don't really care how many yes votes we're getting, because we know it's going to be overwhelming, right? It was 98% yes. Maybe we didn't know it was going to be 98%, but maybe Jesse knew. But every no vote, everyone not voting is a no vote because of this reactionary law. So again, the war room with the charts, where are we weak? And with help from uh, other unions and what the CTO organizes the next morning, the second day of the vote, 50 people out across the city to those weak schools, talking to people, flyering. So every step of the way, it's building the members' power, it's the members organizing and assessing where are we weak, where do we need to strengthen our organizing. I think that was just such a vital part of that. The informational picket lines, the same thing, the same thing, even during the strike. The morning pickets, and then every day at strike headquarters in this build, next door building, all the strike coordinators meeting at noon, led by Noreen, talking about how are things going. Each strike coordinator is responsible for 10 schools. They've been responsible throughout the contract campaign, that whole kind of pyramid structure of leadership. So critical. These strike coordinators who are called district supervisors, who previously really didn't do anything in the union. I, I don't who were suddenly this huge intermediary leadership, so vital to building that structure. Every one of them now see themselves as leaders. So every day during the strike, how are things going? What creative tactics have gone on? What are the most exciting stories to share? I'm probably over my time, aren't I? You're getting there. <laughs> and by the way, since I'm with the Solidarity Campaign, we had 50 people staffing it, and we're very proud of that, staffing the strike headquarters. We had, uh, A lot of people in this room were there. A lot of people in this room donated their time. We, had, we, we brought the food in, the Primos, uh, $4,000 in uh, donations from across the country. We had our, our parallel to Ian's Pizza in Madison. So nobody had to worry about staffing the headquarters in terms of volunteers. Nobody had to worry about food. Uh, from the union side, we, we were very uh, helpful, happy to help with that. And, and you know, just another point about it was, was about a contract campaign is the messaging, which, which Sarah and Jesse talked about. Because 
and, and it's, it's true, it's the struggle that matters, but the message matters. And there have been teachers unions across the country that are pretty much give us a raise. Our, what's our strategy? What's our program? We need a raise, get better, better compensation. And public sector unions. Um, and that's, that's, here's my word again, that's suicide. It can't be we want X more dollars and raise and that's your whole agenda. You lose support from the public and it's not true to the hearts and minds of the teachers. And as they said, you know, a, working, a good working environment is a good learning environment. So how do you teach when it's 90 degrees in your classroom? We, they, they, they got that message out during this strike. How do you teach when you don't have any textbooks? This I think we need to repeat more and more. That the board negotiate, they, you know, they put in writing that they will get textbooks for the kids the first day. Now imagine that you have to actually put that in writing. <laughs> that the, you, have to, you have to have a strike and win that demand that the kids will have textbooks on the first day. We need to get that out more. And that message got out and it, you know, there was a lot that went into that. A lot of trainings went on about the message. You got to fight for compensation for your people. You got to keep those issues clear in fighting merit pay, but you also got to keep your message clear that you're fighting for the public. You're fighting for the parents. This is our struggle. And parents across the city began to feel that this is our struggle. This is not just the team. They're fighting for us. When that poll came out, it, it was not a shock. It was on the basis of four years of work. First with core fighting school closings and then two years of the CTU. When the poll came out that two-thirds of parents with kids in CPS schools supported the teachers. That was hard, dedicated, long work to build those alliances and every union has to do that. Now, you know, it's not so easy because by, by law they cannot strike over these issues. You might remember that the mayor said he was going to get an injunction and we helped uh, initiate the, uh, well we did, we did it. The, uh, the uh, press conference with the community board that's part of the CTU. We had all these speakers, community activists speak, denouncing the injunction on Monday, the sixth day of the strike. But his argument was they're striking illegally. They're not striking over compensation issues. And, you know, Over it was never a strike just over compensation issues. Every single piece of literature, if you watched it closely, every strike bulletin said the union is not on strike over matters governed exclusively by ELRA section 4.5 and 12B. Well, that's so when all their members, over, over and over, every member I saw interviewed on TV, why are you on strike? Because I can't teach when it's 90 degrees in my classroom. There are no libraries in my school. I can't teach with 45 kids. I'm fighting for the kids. Well, those are not strikeable issues. So they got to keep saying the message, and then they put this little thing on every bulletin, which Robert Block, their lawyer, made sure. We were on strike over compensation. I know you were on strike we over compensation. Strike over compensation. <laughs> I'm not saying you were. We were on strike over compensation. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the union did a poll in September of 2011 that found 74% of Chicagoans were favorable to all public school teachers. And so the union does start, that's true nationally, with a higher kind of pro-teacher. You know, my mom's a teacher, my niece is a teacher. That's true of a lot of us. Our neighbors are teachers. We love teachers. They're just so lovable. <laughs> but 60% of that poll were favorable towards the union. Other polls nationally, it's been more like 55%. So part of the union struggle was always to raise that, to bring those together, to identify the love of teachers with why teachers need a union to fight for the parents and the kids. And they did that so successfully in this struggle. And it's, it's just a lesson for the entire labor movement. We don't fight just for us, we fight for justice. And we need to get this message out, I'll stop there. There's so much else to talk about. It's the social media organizing, the outreach to the community, but I'll stop there. We need to get the message out on what these heroes did. They, they have taught the labor movement how to fight and how to win. <laughs>